This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Hi everybody and welcome to the Healthy Dog Pod. Today we have myself and Sophie as always. Hi. As well as Renee from Sydney Dogs and Cats Home. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Renee's coming here today to talk to us all about um, Sydney Dogs and Cats Home. It's, um, well, it's probably best for you to let us know exactly what they are and, you know, tell us a little bit more about it. Sure, no worries. Sydney Dogs and Cats Home is a charity pound in South Sydney. So we call ourselves a charity pound because we provide an alternative to traditional pound services. So we're not actually council, but we provide those services for councils. Uh, and we do, uh, we rehome animals, um, so the charity aspect of us as well is rehoming animals, trying to find the best outcome for those animals. Um, and we try and engage with the community a lot as well. So lots of community programs, school groups, retirement home visits. Um, we work with the army. They come in and do some therapy um, sessions. So yeah, a lot of that sort of stuff. Fantastic. And That's you're cool. related, um, well, not related to, but you work in conjunction with so many councils or across Sydney. Yeah, so eight councils, eight councils um, throughout Sydney um, and they instead of having their own uh, pound they use our services so if they have stray animals from their area they all come into us we hold them for the required amount of time and we try our best to get them back to their original owners that's the plan uh, but if that doesn't happen then we rehome them to new families. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. And what's, um, what's your role with the shelter? I'm the animal care manager. Um, so I manage all the hands-on animal aspects of the place, which is lots of fun. Uh, and I'm also a vet, so I do some vet stuff. And my interest as a vet is behaviour. So you can imagine at a shelter we do a lot of behaviour work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's one of the reasons why when I, um, you know, when we first started talking, actually, we got on really well, I think, because we actually... I noticed that there was a shelter really caring about the behavior of the dogs and not just trying to churn them out. Um, and it was really about trying to you know, look after their welfare in that way, which I think so many, um, you know, it's, it's just not known enough in, the, in general, let alone yeah. in shelters. So, um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I love working with you guys. Um, we... I think we work nicely together. We have done for about a year now, haven't we? Yeah. No, I was really happy to start working with you as well because as much as we try to do our best within that shelter space, there's a big aspect of rehoming these animals where they need a lot of help to settle into their new home. So that's where it's really great to be able to refer to trainers such as yourself, Ian, who can um, train and manage these animals in a similar way that we would yeah we could we um we've well i've worked in shelters myself in the past and i know that like you said it's not just myself working with you guys there's other great trainers i know dom from the dog brigade does as well and you know they um the idea is to really just give you know, our experience to people that are taking on this dog into their home and really give them the best chance to keep them in that home I mean, that's, that's our common goal, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard. I'm coming back. <laughs> I think it's hard because they're kind of in a bit of an artificial environment in, um, in the shelter. And then when they move into the home, then they're in a completely different environment. So having trainers come out and helping set them up, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really, really important. And people do come into the shelter wanting to adopt an animal with the best of intentions. They want to know everything about the animal, whether they're going to fit in with their home. And I just have to say to people, you know, this, this dog or cat has come in from, we don't know where, we don't know what its history is. We've only seen it in this shelter environment, which is, as you say, a really artificial, strange, loud, scary environment to be in. And then going into a new home is a huge transition. It's really stressful for them as well. So, yeah, it's really important that they have help with that. Yeah. I think you say about three months for a dog to fully settle into a new environment. Yeah, typically like when it comes to settling the dog into the home, three months is 12 weeks, 12 working weeks. Um, and the dog's only trying to predict patterns. Yeah. And so its ability to predict patterns is gone like this haywire because it's coming from who knows where before it got to you guys 
<laughs> who has a bloody clue. I mean, I still don't have a clue about where my dog Django. was. <laughs> was before he was in Sydney Dogs and Cats no, Home. I neither. <laughs> um, and then, then they're in, like you say, that high stress environment that, uh, you know, it's noisy, there's change every day. And then when they get to the home, they don't know that they're not going to get moved again. They don't know that. Only we know that. And um, they're just starting to, you know, they're just starting to figure out what the fuck's happened. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it doesn't, I, I just don't think that people give their brains a chance to really um, give it, get a chance to settle in before throwing them in the deep end. Um, they'll see things like hyperactivity and go, oh, he's got loads of energy. You're probably just seeing something that's quite agitated and can't sit still. Um, or you might see a dog that is laying down a lot. And then uh, another end of the spectrum is people go, he's, he's depressed. Let's get him out more. He's tired. He's laying down. Let him lay down. Yeah. Um, and that's where that looking after the mental health side is so important. You know, these dogs, their brains have been going through so much. And they continue to go through so much once we bring them into the home, just because we know they're safe. Don't take it for granted that they know they're safe. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, something else um, we see a lot is dogs come from, whether they come from um, like a city background or even a country background, do you get many r rescue dogs or shelter dogs come get sent to you from out of state or anything like that. I suppose most of yours are pound pickups, aren't they? Yeah, all of ours come from Sydney councils. We work with Western Sydney councils, but they're not um, working breeds a lot of the time. Sometimes they're. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, we do. We just see these dogs come in and they really are, you know, some of them are great. Some of them are absolutely perfect. We're not going to paint them all with the same brush, but some of them are struggling. And that's where treating them like an individual. And treat, looking after the behaviours that they're presenting rather than, like you say, just, oh, it's pretty. I want to take this one home. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> um, Renee, tell us more. Like, so what sort of things um, do we typically see dogs, you know, I'm, I'm going on about it, but you actually see these dogs come in. So what are the common symptoms we see of dogs coming into your shelter? Yeah, sure. The very nature of being in a shelter is unpredictable and yeah dogs do they want a routine they want to know what's going to happen um so yeah the very nature of it we have a lot of volunteers we have dogs coming in and out we have you know different people coming to visit looking to adopt these animals so it is a really unpredictable stressful environment for them and we do see a lot of issues with that so we see a lot of reactivity through the kennel barrier um, that's a big one I think a lot of shelters see that um, and it's just frustration it's you know they can't interact with things how they want to so if they end up barking or jumping around or carrying on at that barrier um, hyper arousal is a big one um, they yeah they're confused they're stressed they don't know what's going on they yeah their um, arousal levels really go through the roof unfortunately and we do get those ones who just um, shut down, I guess you would say. Um, that's their way of coping. They just sort of disengage from everything. Um, cats in particular, you'll see that with. Um, so, yeah, they're probably the three big manifestations of stress within the shelter. And like Sophie said, it's it's an artificial environment. So just because that behavior is presenting in the shelter, that hyper aroused dog might get home and just go, oh, thank God, and no longer be hyper yeah that dog that has been laying down and shut down in the shelter might get home and go oh thank god <laughs> and, start, <laughs> and start running around like an absolute yeah. hood, just having a great time but um you don't necessarily know that that's how that behavior is going to translate to your home environment yeah that's the hardest thing about what we do what we see in the shelter does not predict how they're going to be in the home and you just cannot tell We've got this beautiful old dog at the moment, Herbert. Um, oh, Herbert. <laughs> what a name. I love it. What, what kind is it? Is it he's a mix? A, he's a Ridgeback Cross. He's a, oh. Yeah, he's an eight-year-old old man. He's very, very sweet. I love the oldies. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the shelter, he barks and he's just, he doesn't sit still. He's really stressed. We were thinking, oh, no, this poor guy is so anxious. We sent him out to foster care and the foster carers work full time and he was fine with that. Once he was in a home, you know, we were thinking, oh, no, he's going to be anxious when he's left alone. This is going to be terrible. But no, he was great. Once he got into that routine, he had a comfortable space and a quiet and calm space. He was great. Yeah. 
And in those first, we talk about those first three months, watch your dog more than impose on your dog. Like watch it, see what it actually does, see what it's actually communicating. I always go back to Django, but um, Django was, um, whenever I talk him out the house, he, he was he was always so so friendly, but he would go as tall as he could, he's a hobbit, but he'd go as tall as he could and like make himself big and then like charge over to other dogs if he was off lead. And what I, what I noticed was he, he was just really, really highly strung when in that particular place. So I think I, I've said it before, I've, I took him out on like five walks in three weeks. Mm -hmm. I just let him sleep because if mm -hmm. I left him in the home where he was safe and comfortable, he slept, he mm. slept heaps. He still does. Um, <laughs> but if I actually imposed on my dog and made him do something, then I saw stress and I saw hyper arousal. But if I just left him be, he was really, really, really chilled. And it wasn't really about what I wanted him to do at this stage. I've got the rest of his life to do that stuff, but let him recover first. But I think that comes down to not being educated and people think I need to take him out, I need to expose him to the world. And then it's just too much for the dog. Yeah. We've seen lots of dogs do this. Um, you know, we've got this one that we've worked with, Tommy. Um, oh, Tommy. I love Tommy's Tommy. tail. Tommy's tail. It's like this. <laughs> Literally. It's like, a, it's like a boomerang video, yeah. <laughs> but it's not a boomerang video. It's just constantly on repeat. It's no. amazing. What um, is he? He's like he's a, a Sharpe, Sharpe cross. lab or maybe some staffy, but he's a Sharpe cross. Yeah. yeah. And it, they're lovely owners. They got him. Um, they, they knew exactly what they were getting themselves in for in a way, but they, they'd been watching him online for well, about a month. Uh, nobody was coming towards him. Um, and they announced Tommy's going to be put to sleep today. Aww. So they drove up to the Hawkesbury and got him. Wow. And then they brought him home and let him run around Bondi Beach, in which he fucking smashed like <laughs> oh, so many dogs. Oh, gosh. You're like, guys, great effort. Love you for it. Should have just brought him home and let him rest. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, and, but then the damage was unfortunately done because then he had a learnt association of where they lived. So he couldn't not be there anymore. Like where he lived was imprinted on the brain to be trauma and we worked with this dog for about two years and we got to the point where he was no longer reactive he was at one point reacting to dogs 50 60 meters away mm -hmm. um because he was anticipating danger all the time and we got to a point where he wasn't he was no longer reacting in fact what happened was we introduced him to a puppy and the puppy for some whatever reason diffused him mm. he went oh you're not threatening and from that day forward, his tolerance levels went down. He also was in um, physical pain. We noticed that his head was really firm, like, and not in like a, a skull kind of way, in a, it felt blocked. And the vet drained out an inch and a half of fluid out of his forehead. Oh. And so the dog was in pain. The dog had learned negative associations. And over time, Tommy's behavior just, he relaxed and he relaxed and he relaxed. And then eventually what happened was their dog, they moved. And to this day, Tommy has not, I mean, he's an off-lead dog now. Mm, yeah. Just change. I mean, look, staying in that, if he stayed in Bondi, it might've taken longer. He would have got there, I believe. But just by moving um, to another suburb and just changing the environment, he just went, oh, this is great. Yeah. I remember um, over Christmas this year, um, the family went away and they had a, a dog sitter come in, look after the dog. And when they got back, Jeremy, the owner, was walking him around and everybody was like, all these neighbors were like, oh, you're uh, looking after Tommy. And he said, no, he, he's mine. Um, <laughs> and the randoms in the street were like, oh, Tommy's good friends with my dog. Because <laughs> this dog sitter didn't really know about the problems and we're just letting Tommy run around. Oh, no. Could have gone one of two ways. Yeah. Luckily, it went the right <laughs> way. <laughs> but yeah, bit of a success story there. You know, even if it, even if the rescue or any situation cuts, goes wrong, it's, you can potentially turn it around. It's not guaranteed, but you can definitely start to turn it around. Yeah. Um, Amazing. I've um, banged on again, haven't I? Yeah. I've completely <laughs> took off, off on a tangent. <laughs> I was, was going to ask, can we just backtrack a little bit? Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, about the foster carers and their role and how many you have? Yeah, sure. So we have heaps of cat and kitten foster carers. Um, they're amazing. So last financial year we sent uh, 980 animals out into foster care, which is oh incredible. Um, our foster care coordinator, she's amazing. She does it all single-handedly. She's really, really good. Um, small dogs and puppies, we have no problem finding foster carers for. 
big dogs, we have a big problem. So yeah. it's the same with adopting them out. You know, they need a specific situation. They need people who can work with their behaviour. Um, and we just don't have many of those people, unfortunately. The ones we do have are amazing and it's so valuable to get the dogs out of the shelter. But there just aren't that many out there, unfortunately. I think one of the things that people think when it comes to big dogs or even like breed specific, like uh, guarding breeds or staffies, people believe they need a firm hand. Mm. And what a load of shit. Like yeah. they need just a load of love. Um, they don't need a firm hand. They need, look, experience helps. But then in my in my experience, ex it really people that go, oh, yeah, I know dogs normally come at it with that firm hand approach. Yeah. And they, these dogs just need patience. And if your dog is flooded and acting out, then take it, take it slower. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big problem for us. And we have a really strict screening process for our adopters and our foster carers and the trainers that we work with as well. So anyone who comes and says, you know, any of those words, um, <laughs> <laughs> pack leader, yeah. dominant, being the boss, all those horrible terms that are just so outdated, Anybody who says those sorts of things, we we always have an open mind. We want to mm. educate. We want to, you know, nicely um, explain to these people that that's not how we do things anymore. Um, but yeah, a lot of still a lot of people still do feel that way, and we get people coming in wanting guard dogs and wanting, you know, wanting dogs that they can have that firm hand with and use prong collars and check chains on. And yeah, it's it's not something that we agree with. No, no, these dogs are like I say, been going through the mill. Um, pulling them into your home so that you can basically pulling them into your way of living. Not the best way to adopt a dog, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> just, agreed. <laughs> yeah, agreed. <laughs> and, you know, this that will set the dog up to fail. And we see it a lot um, where, you know, dogs are set up to fail and sometimes it doesn't go well. And, and that's really sad. It is, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I think probably talk about on this set in this one is when it doesn't go wrong uh, it doesn't go wrong when it goes when it doesn't go well <laughs> can't get my words out today and um yeah one of the things we want to talk about is uh euthanasia because mm. it's probably something at the shelter that realistically you have to you're exposed to you have to go through yeah absolutely there's so there's a lot of misconception out there about euthanasia um a lot of people come to us and they think that we're a no-kill shelter, which we're absolutely not. Um, no-kill meaning that we don't euthanize anything is not right. So I would never agree with that. There's many situations where it's the most humane thing to do for the animal to euthanize them. And that's one of the really valuable things that I can do as a vet. You know, if an animal's really suffering, I can help them with that. And that's an amazing thing. Um, there are, you hear scary stories about groups out there who don't euthanize things and who keep animals who really are suffering and who, who shouldn't, um, who shouldn't be kept there. So we really go with the philosophy that every animal who is healthy and treatable, um, they're getting to zero, uh, definition of no euthanasia. That's what we stick to. So we don't put time limits on our animals for adoption. Um, if anyone is healthy and sociable and, you know, has treatable issues, we'll, we'll go to great lengths for them. But unfortunately, there are situations where animals are euthanized. I think it's hard because you want to try and save every animal you can, but sometimes you have to realize that that's not possible. And especially the stories that Ian has and Ian tells me, then there's some animals that it's gone too far and you can't help they're attacking people they're attacking other dogs other animals and there's just no yeah. there's no end the quality of life result. is yeah. Yeah. really affected and that's where and not just of the dog like I, I mean i'm obviously not working in the shelter scene but in the in circumstances i've seen before where and worked in him before um i've had uh, a situation where the dog was a attacking the children um it was a large dog so its potential to cause harm was greater than if it was a smaller one it was attacking the children it was attack attacking the husband and wife less so but still causing harm as in like there was broken bones um wow. and bites on the face wow and um the one of the children had a learning disability 
And so this dog's quality of life was every time it was around anybody, it was panicking. Every time the so it was living in the garden. And then they were like, well, we could keep it alive. Um, but the reality is that my son at any point could open that door mm. because he doesn't understand and he never will um, because of his learning difficulty. And it meant that there was constant fear in the home. The husband and wife were nearly about to divorce. They, it was just an absolute mess. And um, I got asked my honest opinion. And I said, I don't actually think rehoming this dog is an option because it panics at the sight of anything. And its quality of life will get worse if you move it. Um, keeping it in the home, it's not a case of if it bites someone. It's a case of when. And, you know, people have already been put in hospital. And in that situation, I, I never make that on my own. I never make that decision on my own because um, I'm not qualified to and I'm not God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will, gave my opinion and then I referred to a vet and I referred to a vet, veterinary behaviorist. And then as far as I'm concerned, you know, they, they, I know they did. They went and followed on and got more opinions because it's the right thing to do. Nobody should just make that one. I don't, yeah. I don't think I want to make, ever want to be the one that just makes that call. But at the same time, it was, I got asked my opinion and yeah, it was still one of the hardest things I, I've had to do. It's just, but I had to be responsible as well. Cause if I walked away and said, oh yeah, no, no you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. If something happened. That's, you have to have that for the rest of your life as yeah. well. Mm. Like if, that's, not, yeah. if that little boy gets bit on the face again, then that's on me. Yeah. And yeah, there's not a lot, there's not a fun topic, but it's real life. You know, you can wrap it in rainbows all you want, but yeah, it's real life is out happening and that, that's a horrible, horrible situation. Mm. It definitely is. And people underestimate how awful mental health issues can be for animals. So an animal living with chronic severe anxiety, that is just as bad as having severe arthritis or, you know, some sort of physically painful condition. Yeah. And that poor dog that you're mentioning, I mean, being banished to the backyard, being constantly fearful, that is no way to live. That's yeah. awful. So we do see that a lot, you know, those poor dogs who have awful separation anxiety, awful storm phobias, you know, they're destroying themselves and ripping apart walls. They're so anxious. It's just, it's no way to live. No. And that's it. And, I, and if the circumstances can be changed and if, it, if we can look after it and change it, and we do 100% of the time, and then, but every now and then you come into a situation where you go, I don't see a way out of this. This is where I stand. Let me go and ask somebody else's opinion as well, because like I say, like another perspective, but if it gets to a point where there's that many perspectives, you go, well, shit, what do we do? Here? <laughs> and yeah. yeah, it's, um, I mean, in the end that dog, um, it turns out had a neurological problem. Mm. It was a bobtail boxer and there's been a lot of research into them that about how there are neurological problems in these dogs. I remember I've, you know, I've done this, I do this all day, every day. I, I look into dog's eyes, I train them. When I looked into this dog's eyes, I was petrified. I don't get scared of dogs and this dog scared the shit out of me mm. because it was so unpredictable. Mm. Um, it was one minute, it was happy as in like happy as in like <laughs> bouncing. The next minute it was like within seconds, it was growling and then it was in a freeze and then it would bounce again. And you're just left going, I don't know how to be around you. And like I say, I, I, and it wasn't predictable in, in the sense that it wasn't moving in a way that a normal dog moves. It's, it, it just wasn't, it was so scary. Mm. And this is you as a professional dog trainer, let alone the poor family who have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. They, they were like, we can't read this dog. So at mm. the start, you know, before I've met the dog, I'm talking about normal fiddle responses, normal stress-based behaviors, things, early warning systems to look out for. And when I presented with this dog, I looked at it and went, I can't, I have no idea. Like this is, this is not, there's not, there's no pattern of behavior whatsoever. Mm. I remember at one point, um, it, had, uh, it just froze and it was staring at me and it was about six feet away. And so I slowly put my hands in my pocket and, um, was throwing treats to, to get it to turn around and leave me. 
and its eyes weren't even not not just not following it didn't notice them it didn't it it just, it was just that panicked in that moment that it, i did its eye didn't even flinch and you're just going if i move at the wrong time here it it's not going to run away from me mm. yeah. <laughs> um it took me about 15 minutes to get myself out of that situation and i don't find myself in those situations very often so it was scary really scary yeah that's euthanasia is such a big issue for us and it's really hard because every case is like that every case is so sad and you try everything you possibly can but sometimes it still does end up that way and the way that we deal with it is I always get really upset when I hear about people condemning pounds and shelters for just euthanizing everything and being heartless and not caring we're there every day busting our bums to save these animals. You know, if anybody cares, it's us. So we, I feel that we have an obligation to the animals and to the community. If something's dangerous, well, I'm not going to send it out into the world. Yeah. And we do get those animals. We, Because we work with councils, we do get animals who have been involved in serious attacks and we, we have them uh, come into our shelter. And the other big reason is about the animal. Yeah, if it's if it's not humane to rehome this poor animal, say you have an unsocial colony cat that comes in, that poor cat does not want to be rehomed to a home and have to be in close proximity with people for the rest of its life. So we treat every case as an individual and we really go to every length that we can. But unfortunately, sometimes we do make those decisions. That's it. And I mean, going back to the, you know, the guys that work in rescue, they, like you say, they are the ones that care the most. Yeah. yeah. It's not like they're in it for the money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, no. it, genuinely the hardest work I've ever done is working in rescue organizations. I, is it, it is physically and mentally exhausting. That, that environment that we talk about, how stressful it is for dogs to be in there with all the noise and the staff are in there every day and they're surrounded by that every day. And, um, you know, it doesn't help when people are coming in, like you say, and we're trying to give that dog back or cat back to their owner. It's got out of the yard and they come in and abusing staff and shit like that that they don't deserve. Um, it's just, it's such a hard environment. And I've found that people that work in those environments, uh, they, uh, they genuinely care. That's, that's their main overriding factor is they care about animals probably more than themselves. Mm. They, they're prepared to put themselves through that every day for the care of animals so yeah how do you go with staff burning out because it feels like that's mentally physically draining on your staff as well definitely it's a really emotionally exhausting place to work um you work there because you care about animals and so then because you care you see animals in really difficult situations makes it really hard um, my staff are really amazing the lengths that they go to for the animals are really incredible and if we do have to make a hard decision about an animal, then the whole team's involved. We know that we've tried absolutely everything. We know everyone has worked really hard. And that does provide a little bit of relief, I guess, that we know that we've done everything we could possibly do. But, yeah, the staff really bond with these animals. And if if things don't go well, it's really, really hard for them. Even even to the point where um, we see it all the time with your your team. When a dog uh, it does go well, the staff still wear it because they have to leave them. Yeah. So yeah. we see it like these huge roller coaster rides. Cause it's like you know, dog gets rehomed and the, all the staff come out and they can't help it. They love this dog. They spent I don't know how much time with this dog and they go, oh, "I'm going to miss you." And it's, it's literally like every day is these emotional highs, emotional highs, emotional highs, emotional highs. <laughs> yeah, it's full on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but look, I mean, look, it's a horrible topic, but we do get more success stories than we do bad ones, like by a long shot, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. Our euthanasia rates for this year are much better than they were last year. Um, we've saved an additional 189 animals compared to the previous year. So we're doing really well and we're working the benefit of being Sydney Dogs and Cats Home is we work directly with councils. So we're doing a lot to work with cat management, um, just really trying to get animals back to their owners. You know, we'll, I'll drop fees, I'll do whatever I can do to get these animals home. And it's really, it's really helping. So as much as we have a, there's a stigma out there about pounds and shelters, we really are doing everything we can to, to save every animal. 
Yeah, like I love it. Like going in there and we've done some um, training with uh, your volunteers and uh, foster carers. And again, like these these guys, they just care. And if we can give back something like, you know, some information on, you know, how to enter kennels and things like that, then it's our way of kind of adding to, well, trying to help to help the help the cause, I guess. Um, There's something that... Um, you know, I think if if people are aware of what's happening to within these within this world, you know, I I I think if you want to go and get a puppy, go and get a puppy. But if at the same time, don't rule out a foster dog or a rescue dog just because of the stigma. Go in and actually have a look and see the see the dogs because they're beautiful. I mean, all, all of these dogs were puppies once, <laughs> and so um, going in and actually to your rescue organization and actually saying like, okay, can I have a look around? Cause you're going to see some amazing dogs. And at the same time, you're going to see the staff, how much they care and how much the dogs are loved, you know, in the, in these circumstances. So, so tell us um, if people are looking for a dog, a rescue dog, tell us what they can do to sort of get in contact with you and the best way to look for a dog that suits their life. Yeah, sure. It's excellent to take on a rescue dog. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, I have no problem with responsible breeders. If you're doing it right and you're caring for your animals well, I have no problem with that. But there are a lot of dogs out there who already exist and already need a home, so it's excellent to take them on. Um, the best thing to do is to think about what kind of dog is going to suit you before you even go into a shelter, before you even start looking. And that's where I'd even go to a trainer or go to call a shelter and, you know, describe your lifestyle and get some advice about what's going to suit you. Because as soon as you walk in the doors, you're overwhelmed by the animals. They're all adorable. You want to take them all home. You don't listen to the staff who are saying, this dog is not suitable for you. You know, people just want to take it home and they think it'll all be okay. So if you think about it beforehand, what's your lifestyle? What kind of animal is going to suit you? It's activity level, it's temperament, it's size, um, the length of its fur, you know, all that sort of stuff is actually really important. So to think about that beforehand is absolutely essential. And people can't assume that getting a dog is going to change their lifestyle. So that happens all the time. People come in, oh, I'm going to start walking. I'm going to start exercising. I want a dog. No, you're not. You're going to do exactly the same as you did before. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and your dog's just going to, you know, not be happy about it. So be realistic about your lifestyle and what's going to suit you. And then seek the advice of the professionals at the shelter and they can help you out. Yeah. Awesome. Like I know that... I I'm a really active guy, but I hate working out with my dog. So I just do. <laughs> he just sleeps though. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's what I, I did that on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, my old dog, um, I am an active guy and I go running a lot, but I, um, my old dog, I took her running and running and running and running. It didn't help her. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, I was just like, I just want to get home after I've exercised. And that's actually when I want to enjoy my job. Uh, my dog, not my job. <laughs> and um, I, um, and it was just a little acknowledgement within myself of like, okay, not not what would I ideally want, but what do I actually want? What do I really want? And I love just sitting down on the sofa with my dog. Mm -hmm. And that was, so I got the dog that allowed me to do that. Mm -hmm. um, rather than, like you say, I'm not, my, I was never going to change for my dog. I wasn't, I, I, and I, I know that that's probably not the kindest thing to say, but I, and look, we obviously we all make adaptions to, within it, within reason, but I was never going to change my entire personality for my dog is what I'm getting at. And, um, and so knowing that I really just wanted a pub dog that can just sit down with me and I can sneak your chips under the table. <laughs> like that was, that was fine by me. And it's, and that's exactly what he gets. Yeah. That's what you got. Yeah. You got a little pub dog. <laughs> and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You've done exactly the right thing. And honestly, that's why I have a cat and not a dog. I love dogs. I want all dogs to be happy. 
I work long hours. I'm exhausted when I get home. I know I don't have the lifestyle that's going to suit a dog, so I don't have one. And you've got to make that decision beforehand. I'm the same. I have a rabbit. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I've got, what, 30 dogs that I look after every week. You know, I don't have the time to look after a dog. I don't have the place to look after a dog. I don't have the money to look after a dog right now. So... I have a rabbit and <laughs> he's cool. He's just a chiller, isn't he? Yeah, he, yeah. he gets along with Django well. So, so <laughs> they um, they hang out together, which is good. But that's I, I feel like I couldn't give a dog enough of my time mm. to make it as happy as I want it to be. So I'm just waiting. Yeah, it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Working with animals is not really conducive to having your own animal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, um, go, you know, going back to that whole, you know, what, what, what can you do to prepare to bring a dog in your life, a puppy, rescue, whatever, is one, educate yourself on dog behavior in general. Then do some homework into like, or look at yourself and go, what do I want? What do I need? What do I need? is more than what is much more important than what I want. Mm -hmm. And then start looking at, you know, um, some breed types, start looking at, you know, personality types, start looking at just actually doing some homework into what are the potentials that marry up with my criteria. And, um, cause I know when I got Django, I was sitting there talking with your team for about two months, mm -hmm. actually, I'd written down a little th list of things that I wanted and needed from my, from my little dog that I didn't know yet. And <laughs> you guys were great. We were working together and, you know, we get photos of these dogs coming through and I go, yeah, nice dog, but not my dog. And then when Django popped up, I was like, yeah, all right. I'll be there. See you, see you in an hour. <laughs> and like, well, do you reckon uh, you're going to take him home? I was like, well, I'm not leaving home. I'm not leaving here without him. <laughs> <laughs> was it the no teeth smile that got you? <laughs> it was the little bald patches. <laughs> I love him so much. He's so cute. So Sydney Dog and Cat's home. Obviously, you've been based. Uh, where have you? Where are you? I should know that. We're in Carlton, Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're moving. And when is that? And where are you going? So we have taken over some space in Kernel, which is in South Sydney, um, and we are going to be building a brand new facility there, uh, which we're currently fundraising for. We're about halfway to our $3 million uh, goal. So it's an amazing opportunity to build this new facility exactly how we want it to be. Um, and I've done a lot of research into it. I've done some shelter tours in the US, um, really looking into what is the best sort of shelter for these animals. Um, obviously, no shelter would be the ideal. Yeah. No animals needing to be in a shelter, but we do see that there is a need there for that. But we're definitely, it's all going to be focused around the community providing solutions for the community to keep their animals, to keep their animals well and to adopt new animals um, and to really... We want everything to be best practice, the way that we run the place. We really want it to be top quality, world class. Um, and, yeah, we're going to set it up, hopefully, as an example, um, an example facility, and, you know, then we'll take over the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Great Love stuff. It. <laughs> it's It's such an exciting project. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be so good to actually have basically what's going to be the standout kind of, facility um down there and uh you know like you say you're raising that money um there is a is there a gofundme or is there it's all through the website fantastic yeah. so, so you can donate on our website sydneydogsandcatshome.org and it would really really help us out yeah we'll make sure that link is available to everybody on social media um it is going to be such a like you say it's, it's a project that is necessary um ideally it wouldn't be necessary but the reality is that it is so you know it's going to be the the faster we can raise those funds the faster we can get this up and running and um it's such a cool project to really be a part of because we like you say you can set the standard um and then there's going to be some community events for the rest of the year yeah we run a lot of events um so they're all on our website as well um and 
a lot of what we do is really related to the animals. So you can go on there, you can follow the animal stories. We have things like the Senior Pet Project, um, which is really amazing that funnels um, funds into senior animals who need extra care, extra vet treatment. Um, so yeah, you can go on the website and really find something that appeals to you and really send your funds um, directly towards that sort of project. So Yeah, amazing. fantastic. And this, this, these ideas, they bring people closer together with the with the community like you say they raise awareness they're, they're nothing but good things to be happening towards well worthy causes hmm, absolutely we really feel that we can't help animals without helping the people that care for them and live with them so we really do have a big community focus and we're going to stay that way yeah yeah i mean i know that that's exactly how me and sophie work as well as much as we are yeah. a dog to, our um job title is a dog trainer we work with people yeah yeah we have people <laughs> train every day <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today it's been a real pleasure um a little a little eye-opener for for us as well um into the crazy world that is shelters <laughs> especially here in the 